Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see you here. Um, I'm very happy that you've come for these two wonderful lectures this afternoon, followed by a unique uh, shadow puppet performance in Grace Rainey Rogers Hall. So um, I would like to introduce our first speaker, but before I do, I would like to say that this segment of the uh, of this Sunday at the Met is uh, has been made possible uh, by the Doris Duke Foundation uh, for Islamic Art, and we're most grateful to them. They've supported many programs here at the Met since we reopened our uh, galleries of the art of the Arab lands, uh, Turkey, Iran, Central Asia, and later South Asia in 2011. Now I'm going to introduce our next speaker, who is Peter Liu. Um, he received his uh, BA from Princeton and MA and PhD from Harvard, uh, where uh, physics was his subject. Uh, he's presently a postdoctoral research fellow in the Department of Physics in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Harvard University. So the main focus of his um, work is on the physics of attractive colloids. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but he's not going to be talking about it, those attractive colloids today. Um, and the integration of high-performance imaging and analysis uh, techniques. He has conducted a series of experiments aboard uh, the International Space Station. Um, probably not, uh, you, you weren't up there yourself though, right? Okay, your, your experiments were there. Um, examining phase separation of colloid mixtures in the absence of gravity. Um, he has also published his discoveries of modern quasi-crystal geometry in medieval Islamic architectural tilings. Um, very interesting subject uh, for people in his field and for people in the field of Islamic art and architecture as well. Um, and also the, he's written on the first precision compound machines from ancient China, the first use of the diamond in prehistoric China, uh, and the first quasi-crystalline mineral found in nature. So um, I welcome Peter Liu and thank you for joining us. All right, well thank you very much uh, to Curator Camby for uh, this really generous invitation. I'm merely a postdoc, so this is well above my pay grade, especially when you consider how much they pay me. But uh, just want to thank you guys uh, for coming out on this Sunday. So I have uh, published a little bit, just a one paper, on this certain quasi-crystalline geometry, which is a, a modern concept that we didn't understand in the West until the 1970s. But I, I think this is a really amazing exhibition and opportunity because the antecedents, if you will, for a lot of these ideas came and started in the Seljuk period. So this is a bit of an origin story for the kind of mathematics and the tilings of medieval Islamic architecture that I've been interested in for a long time. So without further ado, let's take a look at some of the things that I find interesting. So I'm going to take you to a bunch of sites in uh, Seljuk, Anatolia, and western Iran to take a look at, at some of these ideas. So this is a Sultan Han, so it's a caravanserai. It's a place where travelers would have stopped to uh, on the Silk Road overnight. And uh, there's a lot of different interesting architectural features. I want you to focus on this central building here, which is actually a mosque. And on the back side, here's uh, the other side from that photo, there is a tiling here, okay, or a pattern. We're going to zoom in and take a look here, all right? So this is really what I'm interested in. What are the ideas, what are the concepts, what are the tools mathematically that they would have used to make this particular tiling? So in physics speak, I would say that the area in the blue rectangle is something we would call the unit cell, which means that if we make that pattern, we can copy and paste it and then generate the whole pattern. So there's a lot, I, I will show you how we do all of this. Now, uh, just sort of springboarding on this beautiful talk by uh, Dr. Ackerman, uh, let's take a look at this particular rectangle. And before I started looking into this in, my, in this field about 10 years ago, if you looked in the literature, they would say that, well, Islamic designers used techniques that were inherited uh, from the ancient Greeks. So a compass to draw a circle, a straight edge to draw a straight line. But this was also a bit of a limiting principle saying, and I think this was a, a bit of, not really quite fair, but to say that what we knew from the Islamic designers was sort of limited by what they learned from the Greeks. And hopefully I can convince you that quite the opposite. They took these ideas and then expanded them in new ways that the ancients uh, never did. So 
you know, we have words like algebra or algorithm, and these are from uh, the Islamic world. And exactly as Professor Ackerman said, the reason that we actually still have these documents is because they were preserved, transmitted, translated by the medieval Islamic world. So uh, let's just take a look and see what we can do with those two tools of drawing uh, with circle and straight edge and how we can make uh, some of these patterns, okay? So we're gonna start by dividing a circle evenly into 10 parts. Now, this actually comes out of Euclid's Elements, and then I believe the fifth century BC. And in particular, we also have documents from the medieval Islamic period showing that they knew how to do this. So you could divide a circle exactly into five with a set of pretty complicated constructions with a ruler and compass, but you can do it. And then once you have it div divided into five, you can subdivide every segment pretty easily into 10. All right, so we know that they knew how to do this geometrically exactly correctly, and they had the mathematical proofs to show that. Now what I'm gonna do is connect every third vertex, so it makes a star pattern. And then I'm gonna start a second circle with this one point of the compass on the red dot, one on the blue dot. I'm gonna draw this second circle, draw another one. We're gonna make a rectangle. Uh, the, the height of the rectangle is di the diameter of the new circles. The width of the rectangle is the first circle we drew. I'll extend some lines, use uh, the straight edge to make these lines, delete the the segments, okay, look, the details of this, uh, other people have worked out, but I just wanna show you, right, that you could do it with this simple set of tools and you can make this pattern, okay? So, again, other people have worked this out before I did, but you get this here, right? So now, we can use a very simple cut and paste uh, technique to now generate this pattern out to infinity, right? So you can see that with just those simple tools, with the compass and the straight edge, we're able to make this pattern. Okay, I think fairly straightforward. Now, let me ask you to take a minute and play a little bit of a mathematical game with me. All right, so we're gonna start out with this pattern and I'm going to say outside the original circle with which we drew, so ignore the gray, but every time you see those two blue lines intersect, I'm gonna cut it in half. I'm gonna take what's called the angle bisector and I'm gonna draw a red line through it. So we'll start out here and uh, you see these red dots and we'll extend them. Okay, so this now goes through the pattern. Now, why did I do that? Well, that gives us three different new shapes. There's this blue decagon, the green hexagon, and the pink bow tie, okay? So, this is still a game that I'm introducing, right? Whether this is historically significant remains to be seen, but just follow along with me. But that gives us an alternative way to conceive of this particular tiling, okay? So now, we can overlay that on the building and can say, look, if, if we have those tiles, the blue line decoration is what is actually featured on the carving of this Seljuk building, all right? Now, why would I do that? Well, it's interesting because then you could imagine that if I gave you those puzzle pieces, you or an average three-year-old could actually build this tiling. Right, so we started out with this very complicated compass and straight edge construction, but that required a lot of mathematical training, right? But now you've got a work crew, they've got to build this building. If you have some very intelligent designers give you those tiles, you could hand it over to a work crew, for instance, and now you could build this tiling. And we can extend it out over and over again. We could, in fact, make an infinitely large tiling if we wanted to, all right? So that gives us a set of what I'm calling the Giri tiles. So the Persian word for not is gire, and in the, liter the literature for these geometric patterns, they would call them uh, gire patterns, so I just decided to call them the Giri tiles. Now the rules of these tiles are, we stack them like a jigsaw puzzle and just make sure that the edges line up, and then we keep only that blue line decoration and put that on the building. Very simple, right? So uh, I've shown you these three tiles, uh, but it turns out that there are a limited number of rotations because everything, there's 10 sides to the decagon, they're uh, all at very precise angles, and you have to line up all the other edges of all the tiles ultimately with those, so that gives us five independent bow ties and hexagons if we take out the ability to rotate them. So you can imagine with this set of tiles you slide and you can make these patterns. And then there's a couple other tiles with, you could derive from similar construction, these purple rhombuses and uh, these yellow pentagons, okay? So let's just use this as a tool to see, can we understand the construction of other Seljuk architectural patterns in, uh, in, from the time? All right, so this is another Sultan Han, another caravanserai. So this is near the modern city of Aksarai. So this is a different building than the first one that I showed you. And now I want you to take a look at the back uh, portal. And there's a tiling pattern here on the right. 
Okay, so this is now carved in stone, and we can zoom in. And now what I'm going to do is just overlay a tessellation of those Geary tiles. And you can see that the blue lines explain all the decoration in this particular building, right? So this is now the idealized reconstruction of that tiling. So I'm going to show you sort of several buildings with this kind of, of format. But this may look familiar because if we rotate that 90 degrees, you can actually overlay that over the other building. So it actually shows that they use the same exact building. The, the previous Sultan Han was uh, between two cities, Kaiseri and Sivas. This is several hundred kilometers away, but yet they use the exact same pattern. Right? So I think these tiles help us to break down what looks like very complicated geometry, but now we can sort of put it into pieces that our minds can conceive how they might have been constructed. Okay, so this is a real treat for you guys in the exhibition. This is Isidrachale Madrasa in the city of Konya. 1242 to 1243, and in fact, there is a tiling with some of this glazed tile. There's some tile fragments uh, in the exhibition, so you absolutely have to go see this. It's very exciting. So I, I got there, and I was like, wow, it's really great. So uh, my interest is on a different part of the building. So there's this rectangle here and this tiling, right? So this is the same material that you will see in the exhibition, glazed tile. And now we can look at how this was constructed by overlaying a tessellation of these Geary tiles. Right? Now, what is cool about this is that when you look at it, we have the same tiles. Right? This is a blue decagon, the green hexagon, the pink bow tie, but it's a different arrangement than the previous building I showed you. Right? So it looks like they're using the same tiles in different combinations to make patterns that have some of the same underlying geometry, but they're not identical. And here I can outline that unit cell or repeat unit in yellow. Right? So you can now sort of see how they might have been able to make the tiles build these little unit cells, replicate it, and make this extended tiling with a very reasonable amount of effort. All right, so now we can take a look and see how these tiles may have been used in other places. This is the Izedin Kekavos uh, tomb tower. So this is one of the Seljuk rulers from 1220. This is in the Silk Road sort of central connecting city of Sivas. So there's a lot of interesting roads going through there. And this is uh, his tomb. And now we can take a look at the construction of this very nice uh, tenfold pattern in the center. And here is the Geary tile tessellation. But you can think of this a bit almost as a cutout of a greater pattern, right? So we have a decagon. We have these alternating sort of radiating bow ties and hexagons. And then we have another ring of decagons, right? So it's a very, I think, beautiful, compact pattern that we see in this particular building. Now we can ask, you know, is this sort of a one-off or did they, maybe they use this in other uh, Seljuk building. So let's take a look here. This is the Maperi Juan Tatun Madrasa in uh, Kaiseri. So this is on the back wall of uh, the Madrasa or the Islamic school. And we can overlay uh, the Giri tiles on this. And you can see it's a pretty similar pattern. We have that decagon radiating bow ties and hexagons. And so you could look at that as another cutout of the same pattern. Uh, going a little bit forward in time, now this is the Seljuk capital of Konya. This is the Sahibada complex, and this is on the wall between the madrasa and the tomb. And there's this really amazing open work tile, I guess you had a structure there, in a window. And you can see, then we overlay this, again, it's the same pattern, and it's this decagon surrounded by bow ties and hexagons, and embedded as sort of a cutout of the same exact pattern, which we're now seeing in several different places. It actually extends sort of on this theme of the Seljuks connecting to other dynasties and empires. This is sort of what followed them, the Mongol conquest or the Ilkhanid, I mean, dynasty is maybe not the right word, but the Ilkhanid period. This is the Chifta Minarela or double tower um, uh, madrasa in uh, Sivas. And you can see on the back of the entrance portal, there's this pattern here. Zoom in. This is a, a roundel that's been carved into the stone. And when we do the Geary tile overlay, you can see that we've got this decagon again with the same bow ties and hexagons in the identical arrangement. So we have this identical pattern going for hundreds of kilometers all throughout the Seljuk world and afterwards. And I think the tiles really do help us understand how that may have been the case. OK, now look, I've given you this construction, right? It's a little bit pathological, but we, we did this sort of subdividing thing. And we've made these tiles, right? But is this just something that I came up with as a way to maybe break down existing tiles? Or is there a historical reason to believe that this was actually used, right? So what I've given you here, right, is a very nice tenfold pattern. But you know, you really probably could have done it with a compass and a straight edge, right? Are there any reasons to believe that they actually used 
the particular tiles that I'm suggesting, right? So that's a question that I think we can answer in two ways. The first is to look at existing buildings, and then the second is to maybe ask some questions about historical documentation. But let's just take a look at some buildings to start out with. Okay, so this is the Ulu Jami, or Great Mosque, in Malatya, Turkey. This is about 100 kilometers north of the Syrian border. So I was glad to be there when uh, things were not quite so dicey. But let's take a look at, there's a little pattern here on the left. And let's zoom in and take a look at this, right? So this is, you know, Seljuk, really right in the middle of it. And you can see here there's this pattern. It's got this nice tenfold star in the middle. And you can see we can do the Giri tile overlay. And we started out with this decagon, and you can see this ring of bow ties and hexagons as before, right? So maybe it's the same thing. But now look beyond that. There is no ring of decagons, but you've got these hexagons and bow ties here, and they're not in any kind of symmetrical arrangement, as if they just kind of put some tiles down to sort of fill in the area. It's not symmetric, it's not repeating, but it's definitely not something you would be inclined to do if you were starting out with a compass and a straight edge. Whereas if you had the tiles and you needed to fill in the area, it kind of makes sense to put those there, right? So let's, let's take a step back and say, okay, are there patterns that this tile-based paradigm using the Geary tiles are much easier to understand how they might have been constructed inherently in their own features? And to start out that question, let's go to the Kirk Kislar uh, tomb tower in Nixar. So this is also from the 1220s, and you can see there's this very nice panel above the window in this tomb tower, and this is made out of brick. So you see a lot of pentagons, right? So they're doing this sort of five-sided stuff, but they're in kind of an interesting arrangement, right? Like, why would you particularly choose to do this? Well, I think if you, if you tried to line it up, if you had to draw all those pentagons, it might be quite a bit of work, but it's not so hard to imagine when you actually actually have these Geary tiles because it's just an ordered array of one tile, the hexagons. And so we can just take one tile, copy it, and we can explain what might have otherwise been kind of a big hassle to draw. But again, maybe this is a little bit marginal. So let's take a look at uh, how they built up this tool set by adding some more tiles. So now back to the Great Mosque in Malatya. On the right pillar here, there's this pattern. And now you can see that this is in both uh, brick and glazed tile at a pretty early period. But we can overlay this with this set of the Geary tiles. So now we're adding the second tile, right? The bow tie and the hexagon. And you can see that this is a nice ordered array. So you have this one bow tie here. You have half these bow ties. And you can see how this repeats with just a very simple arrangement of the two tiles. If you tried to draw this again with a compass and a straight edge, you have a lot of these pentagons to place. And remember, making this five-sided figure is a lot of work. And how would you necessarily guarantee that you didn't have things start to get misaligned or your angles aren't exactly perfect? Whereas the tiles, I think, give you an easy way that you might have been able to put this together. All right, so let's see you know, how these two tiles, the hexagons and the bow ties, may have been used in other Seljuk buildings. So this is the Mamakhatun uh, tomb tower, or the Kumbeti, and this is early. So there's actually only a few buildings left that have this geometry from before the year 1200. This is one of them. So this is in northeast Turkey now, almost uh, closer to the Armenian border. And on the left of this is a panel here, which we can zoom in and see. And this is pretty cool because now we have this pattern, right? So this is looking at these Geary tiles. We have this sort of set of bow ties separated by a vertical hexagon. Then they're together, then apart, then together. So it's a nice repeating ordered array. Again, the same two tiles as we saw in Malatya, but in a different arrangement. Now this pattern also, you can look at to ask if this occurs anywhere else. And in fact, it does. So this is an overlay from the panel. And this building is uh, known as the Sitamelik tomb tower, and this is in a city called uh, Divri, which has a very famous hospital complex. But this is also amazing because this is, you know, hundreds of kilometers away and also very, very early, so 1196 to 1196, yeah, 1196-ish. So it's pretty interesting that these constructs are being used to generate, you know, pretty large tilings very early on. Okay, so now let's take a look at uh, back in Konya. So this is the Seljuk capital. And you can see uh, in the exhibition, there's actually a picture of this building um, in one of the, the plaques. So it was, uh, there's a palace that there are some, some tiles from. And this is the main central mosque, uh, the Aladin Jami, from the 1230s for this tiling 1240s in Konya. So this is the Mihrab. So again, springboarding off of Professor Ackerman's beautiful talk. The Mihrab is where you would pray in the direction of Mecca. And there's a huge... Uh, with the astrolabe and some other techniques of a huge amount of information and documentation on how they actually figured out what direction Mecca was from all these different sites all over the Islamic world. But um, this building, or this, this mihrab, is 
in against sort of a flat wall, right? And the shape of this room is basically a gigantic, you know, cube or rectangular prism like, like this room is. But above it is a circular dome. And so if you want to transition between a cubic sort of room, if you will, and a circular dome, how do you do that? And there's lots of different techniques. You could go back to the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul to see one way. What they did here was something that in the literature have been called Turkish triangles, which is kind of an anachronism. But nonetheless, there are these triangular uh, panels that you can see at the top that allow you to transition between a square room and a, a circular dome. And these panels here are decorated, OK? So here is uh, one of them, and this is, again, the tiles very similar to what you would see in the exhibition for this uh, tile fragment from Sirchale Madrasa. And you can see here that we've got this nice five-folded uh, pattern. So what is this pattern constructed of? Well, this is actually not so different from what we saw just now in Mama Khatun and uh, Sitemelek, right? You've got these open, uh, this sort of separate uh, bow ties with a vertical hexagon in between and these two coming together. But then when you come down here, they didn't repeat the pattern, right? They, they decided to do something different. So this pattern is left-right symmetric, but it's not repeating itself. So again, it's hard to imagine that they used a compass and straight edge construction to make a tile and repeat it when you can see if we have these, these Geary tiles, you can just place them and fill in the area and you can explain what's actually on the building. All right, so to see where this also might have been done in some other Seljuk buildings. This is the Gürk Madrasa, or Sky Madrasa, in the uh, northeastern city of Tokat in Turkey. And oops, there is this uh, central portal, and in that portal, there is this particular carved panel, which I think is just absolutely fascinating. Why? Well, let's take a look. We can now do this Giri tile tessellation and overlay, and you start out with these pairs of bow ties, right? They're sort of to the left, to the right, to the left, to the right. So they sort of repeated this cadence, A, B, A, B, A, B, if you will. But then at the bottom, they decided to just put two bow ties together, right? So this tiling, it doesn't repeat. It's not symmetric. But yet we can explain every line as a decoration of the same two tiles, right, in the sort of central uh, in the central part of this building on the portal. So I think this is really quite interesting that they did this because I think you can think of now jigsaw puzzles and pieces of these tiles as a way to explain the construction of a lot of buildings in the Seljuk period. All right, so we can see, let's go back to the Aladdin Jami, and there's another uh, pattern on the, one of these Turkish triangles, and we can see here, again, let's do the Giri tile overlay. And what you see is we've got a row of bow ties, these hexagons, now we've got bow ties, these rhombuses. So again, it's another one of these you know, patterns that you can explain as the assembly of a jigsaw puzzle of these tiles, but it never repeats and it's not symmetric. So I just don't see how this existing paradigm of compass and straight edge is necessarily going to explain in a very sort of simple way how these patterns were made. So I think that's a very interesting transition where these uh, Tilings are now being thought of as jigsaw puzzles instead of, say, repeating units. OK, so for the final sort of Seljuk example from this, let's take a look at the Gunbadi Kabud from Marge. So all the photos that I've shown you previously were ones that I took myself in Anatolia. This one, you can see the people are in traditional dress, and that's because this photo is from the 1870s. So this was actually taken by a man named Antoine Sevrugin. Uh, so this is, you know, Within the first few decades of the history of photography, people were going out and photographing uh, the Holy Land, the Middle East, all of these places. And what's really, really useful about this is that we get to see what the building looked like before any kind of modern restoration, so we can have uh, complete confidence that this is exactly the way it was built. So let's take a look at one of the panels here in the building and zoom in. OK, so by now, maybe it's not so surprising uh, to convince you that this thick brick pattern here with this pentagon, you can now explain as the blue line decoration and a tessellation of these Geary tiles. Right? But what's really interesting about this building is that there is a secondary line pattern. Right? So you can see here, for instance, there's this figure eight sort of squiggly thing. There's these dots. There's things here that really don't share this decagonal or five or tenfold symmetry at all. all right? So I've highlighted this pattern in white. Well, the hexagon, the bow tie, and the rhombus. But what's really interesting about this white pattern is that it has left-right and top-down symmetry. So it shares the symmetry of the particular tiles without sharing the symmetry of the blue line decoration in terms of its pentagonal or decagonal construction. Right, so now, why do the tiles explain how this pattern was constructed? Well, now you could imagine right, that if you just decorate the tiles with the two levels of decoration, you can apply it to the building and generate this very complicated two-level tiling. 
And it also gives us an idea of how conceptually they could have put this, put this together in a very reasonable way. Because now, because of symmetry, you only have to design a quarter of this tile. You place the white lines in such a way that they connect here at the boundaries so that when you connect the other tiles, they line up. But now I only need to place two or three lines by symmetrizing within the tile. So flip it left, right, and top, bottom, I generate the whole tile. And then by tessellating or putting a set of these tiles together, now we can have these double continuous nets with different kinds of symmetry in a very, I think, understandable way. But I think this also provides, in my opinion, sort of hands down confirmation that they had to be using these tiles, because I don't see any other way you ever would have been able to figure out how this building was put together. But I think it's a, a pretty strong and exciting testament to the sophistication conceptually of the geometry and the mathematics that was going on and applied in an art and architectural context in the Seljuk period. I mean, this building is 1197, so it's 800 years old. All right, so let me in the last few minutes address, uh, and you can see how this, the Giri tiles are overlaid, but let's talk about documentation, right? Is there any sort of historical source that can explain anything about these tiles? And to answer that question, this is the Topkapi scroll. So there are these architectural scrolls. This is from a little bit later, a Timur and Turkmen context. And this is something, it's, it's a scroll that's now in the Topkapi Museum, but originally came from Central Asia. It was moved there by the Ottomans about 15th century. And this black line decoration is what would have been applied to the building. So this was kind of like a cheat sheet, if you will, for master builders. They would go up to a site, they would unroll to one of these panels and say, oh, there's a design, let me put that on this building. So you can see the black lines, that would have shown up on the building, but the red dots there are also actually in the manuscript. So I didn't draw those in, but now we can sort of fill in with the colors that I'm using and you can see these are the Geary tiles. Right? So there's several other panels, they have different arrangements of the tiles, but yet the same tiles themselves making a rich variety of patterns. Right? And they get more complicated in the scroll, and you know, finally the 28th panel has all five of the Geary tiles. So that's actually how I, I was working on this, looking at the scroll and said, oh, these tiles showed up, and then sort of ex post facto applied it to the building. So the construction that I showed you is more for pedagogical than historical reasons. But at least you can see that there. And what's really interesting is that there's also this thick red line, which turns out to decorate Geary tiles at a much larger length scale, and how you can see the arrangement of little tiles fits into the big one, respecting the symmetries. So these things are really incredibly sophisticated. But again, all starting from the Seljuk era. All right, so in the last uh, couple of minutes here, let me hit very hard on this theme of what the Seljuks are doing to connect to other people. And let's take a look at what's going on with other buildings with Giri tiles, but sort of in the same period. So this is the Al-Mustan Madrasa in Baghdad. I did not take this photo. This is uh, from uh, 1227. So right at the same time as these monuments in Konya, and you can see that this white line decoration can be explained as the decoration of the Giri tiles, right? But now we can take this pattern, let's rotate that 90 degrees and extend it, and you can now explain the decoration on this building, which is the mausoleum, the mihrab in the mausoleum of Kalaun in Cairo. So this photo I took just a couple weeks ago when I was there. And this is exciting because this actual white line that you see is mother of pearl. So they used a whole bunch of different really exotic materials to make this. But again, it's the same pattern with the same tiles that we've seen all over the Seljuk world. Uh, right after the Seljuks of the Ilkhanid, so this is the Uljetu mausoleum, so one of the Mongol conquerors. And this is the ceiling on his gallery. And you can see here, this is the Giri tile tessellation, which uh, you guys are probably familiar with now. But take a look at this unit cell, and it turns out that is the 62nd panel of the Topkapi scroll. So we can relate the Seljuks, the tiles, the Ilkhanids, and to the scroll that shows up later on in the Turkmen Timurid context. And inside his mausoleum was this very large brick uh, sort of set of pillars, and you can see this combination here of the tiles which we unwrap. So this is 1307, right? So not so long after the Seljuks. But what's cool is if we turn this pattern 90 degrees, we can now overlay this and explain the construction of the Sultan's Loggia in the Yeshil Jami in Bursa. And this is an Ottoman era building, but it was actually decorated with artists from Tabriz in the city of Iran. So I just wanted to give you a taste of uh, where some of these ideas that originated in Seljuk Anatolia got to be taken. It turns out these tilings show up in other Ottoman buildings, a huge amount of interesting things in the Timur dynasty, and then on to the Mughals, right, ultimately until right before the Taj Mahal. And we see that these tiles can be wrapped on curved surfaces. They were subdivided to make these quasi-crystalline geometries, and I unfortunately don't have time to tell you that story, so maybe another time. But just to give you a sense of all this coming very early in buildings 
from the Seljuk period, and I think it's really quite exciting. So let me just uh, thank uh, some of the people that really helped out. I want to advertise Professor Suzanne Yalman is talking in the symposium uh, on June 9th and 10th, and so there we are in front of uh, Keikavus' tomb having a proper tea. Uh, Professor Oya Pantarolu at Boazici University also was a great help in uh, helping me date all the buildings, and all three of us worked very much with Professor Guldur Nejibolru, kind of the queen mother of the field at Harvard, so she is really the one that has trained me in all of this the most. Also, Professor David Roxborough there, Andras Riedelmeyer, uh, curates the, the photo collection. And then, you know, all of us, we always talk about people with highfalutin degrees, but the one person that really made this happen was Abdullah Chadak, who was my taxi driver all over Anatolia, <laughs> rocketing all over the place on 160 kilometers an hour to catch up with my plane and going into all kinds of crazy places. So if you're ever in Konya and you need a taxi, email me and I will give you the number. Uh, I want to thank the Aga Khan prof uh, Program for Islamic Architecture at Harvard, the Research Center for Anatolian Civilizations at Koch University, and my webpage has both a video to the other talk about the later team rid tilings and a, some more of the Giri tiles and a way to contact me. So I'm happy to take, we'll take questions now. I'm, I'm going to stay after. If you have additional questions, feel free to look me up and send me an email if you want to continue the discussion. So thank you very much for your attention and for the general... <laughs>